Take a look at this electrocardiogram. We know it's from an elderly patient with heart failure and a previous ECG showing rapid atrial fibrillation. She now presents to the emergency room complaining of nausea. We have this current ECG. In other words, she was treated some time ago for rapid atrial fibrillation. Was her medication adjusted? She went home and some time later, she returned with complaints of nausea and this ECG was obtained. So what is the diagnosis? What is your opinion on it? Examining the electrocardiogram at hand, the striking aspect is that we are unable to discern the P wave. As we analyze the QRS complexes, we notice that despite being bradycardic, which means we're observing a bradycardic rhythm, it remains irregular. This observation strongly supports the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. However, instead of high ventricular response, it is exhibiting a low ventricular response. The patient is also experiencing nausea. Why is this happening? Upon scrutinizing the ventricular repolarization, we detect an alteration in the ST segment. This anomaly is visible across all leads, particularly if you look at leads D2 or V3 to V6. This pattern is akin to what we term as a spoon sign. This sign is not indicative of digitalis toxicity, but of digitalis saturation. However, when we consider the woman's symptoms of nausea and observe atrial fibrillation with low ventricular response, we must suspect that this patient may be experiencing digitalis toxicity. Therefore, we identify atrial fibrillation with a ventricular response combined with ST changes that are compatible with digitalis intoxication or ischemia. In reality, these ST segment alterations are compatible with digitalis saturation. Yet, when combined with the symptoms of nausea and atrial fibrillation with a low ventricular response, we need to consider digitalis toxicity. While these ECG changes don't conclusively rule out ischemia, based on the clinical presentation, we can infer they are likely secondary to digitalis toxicity. Recall that when a patient suffers from digitalis toxicity, they may experience a range of arrhythmias, from tachyrhythmias to bradyrrhythmias. Examples of bradyrrhythmias that may occur include sinus bradycardia, synotrial block, or the patient might endure such an extreme bradycardia that it evolves into a junctional escape rhythm or atrioventricular blocks ranging from first-degree AV block to complete heart block. In terms of tachyrrhythmias, the patient could develop junctional tachycardia, atrial tachycardia with variable block, or even experience an increase in the number of ventricular ectopic beats, ranging from isolated ventricular ectopic beats to ventricular tachycardia or even ventricular fibrillation, potentially leading to death. Remember, certain factors can predispose an individual to digitalis toxicity, meaning a high serum level of digoxin in the blood. When these factors are present, a patient can transition from saturation to toxicity because the therapeutic range of digoxin is very narrow. Therefore, the margin between therapeutic and toxic serum levels is quite slim. When these factors are present, even patients under digoxin therapy can progress to toxicity. These factors include patients with cardiac amyloidosis, those with chronic lung disease, who have a higher propensity to develop toxicity, patients with hypercalcemia or hypokalemia, and those with hypomagnesemia. Additionally, patients with hypothyroidism, hyposemia, those undergoing an acute myocardial infarction, the elderly, and those with renal insufficiency are also predisposed to toxicity, as these conditions can decrease digoxin clearance. Moreover, patients with atrial fibrillation and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome are at a higher risk for digitalis toxicity when using digitalis drugs such as digoxin.